Moments later, I hear breathing right behind me. Like I'm tucked into this brush and right behind that brush, something is moving and breathing its way along. And I think, oh, this is it. Like it is right there. I'm frozen totally still. I have a good wind. It's either a buck or it's a mountain lion and I'm about to die. But either way, I'm gonna sit right here. Welcome to Hunting Stories, brought to you by Late to the Game Outdoors. Everyone loves a good story, and hunters have some of the best. Our whole mission is to collect and share great stories from hunters just like you, to entertain and keep you motivated all year long. So, pull up a seat around the campfire, because here we go. Hello and welcome back to the Hunt Stories podcast. I am your host Eric, as usual, and this is a—it's its own story, but it is also sort of a continuation of the story in the last episode. So, the last episode was number eighteen, I believe, and it was the story of uh, my family deer hunt out at the farm with my wife and son. Bucks were seen, shots were fired, nothing died. And then in Arizona, what happens is, uh, like, the second part of December, a a last-chance over-the-counter archery deer hunt opens up in a lot of units, including the unit the farm was in. And uh, typically, I get myself out in the backcountry and spend a few days, usually, like, in that between Christmas and New Year's downtime. And it's cold, and there's bucks everywhere, and I love it. And it's a little pre-rut in most places, but sometimes you catch some activity... Uh, it's it's just a good time, and if I haven't filled my deer tag with a bow or a rifle yet, it's this great last chance, just the tag says any antler deer, and that is what I chase. Uh, so usually, I disregard the farm, because often the deer kind of move on from the farm later in the year, and it's also virtually impossible to spot and stalk. I mean, it's just acres of totally flat land. Uh, so if you see some out in a field, There's usually not a lot you can do to get them there. But this particular year, uh, a lot happened, uh, aside from COVID. But uh, schedule-wise, I did not have a few days I could string together for a big hunt like that. The spot, like my go-to December spot, uh, had burned down in a fire. And uh, I honestly didn't even have time to really get out and scout a lot of other places. I checked a couple places here and there, you know, for a morning at a time and didn't turn much up. So as I just accepted reality, I I thought, well, if I'm going to use this tag at all, I should maybe just head back out to the farm. My father-in-law still had cameras running. There were still bucks showing up a little less frequently than back in November, but there was a chance. So why not? Um, And so I managed to find one whole day and then two evenings to be out there hunting. Like, it's a couple weeks season, and that was literally all I could string together with work and family and and general life. So, the day, the long day that I spent out there, got there pre-dawn, hiked in in the dark, sat down in this this little blind my father-in-law had kind of carved into this big tree on the property. But it's kind of by the corner of this field where a lot of times there, there's deer out there feeding in the night, and then as the sun comes up, they kind of make their way out and and might come past that blind. I sat there for, you know, 10, 15 minutes, and even as the faintest glow of light was coming up and I was looking through my glass, it was clear there was nothing in that field, and the the farm was pretty much dead. So I drove all around, checked for tracks and sign, and there was plenty of it, but it was not as fresh as it had been. Just... Typically what happened, the deer just seemed to migrate through this area, so I knew we were getting towards the the time when when they weren't going to be hanging around anymore. But I committed, like, I already drove all the way out there, I'm I'm here, so drove around, checked stuff, kind of made a plan to sit up on this high point where I would be nowhere near where deer would come in, but I could at least see a few different typical points of entry, and maybe I could, you know, kind of duck behind a, a berm or use some cover to, to close the distance, but at least I could pinpoint what's going on. So I hung out in my truck, took a little nap, just sort of rested, waiting for the evening, posted up in that spot. As I'm sitting there, all sorts of things start happening on the farm. Like, like it's, 
it's a working farm, so there are people, there's machinery. That it's Some of the advantage there is that the deer are not inherently freaked out by human activity. I mean, they're suspicious. You can't just walk up to them, but, but they're not as skittish as other deer might be. But as I'm sitting there, I, I'm looking through my glass and, you know, pull up the spotting scope and, and I see a couple trucks way off in the distance. There's a couple of old, like dilapidated buildings on the farm. Uh, and I see a couple trucks over by one of them and I put up the glass and start looking. And to the best of my estimation, which is a phrase now, uh, it looked like a large family setting up for family Christmas photos. So this was about a week before Christmas and uh, everyone's in sweaters and they're just kind of standing around waiting for golden hour. And I'm like, oh, great. This is some commotion, but it's it's kind of far away. There's, there's still a chance it doesn't ruin my hunt. And not long after I had noticed that, this truck comes driving through. Uh, looks like a couple of guys who work on the farm. Uh, and they drive right past me. I don't know if they see me or not, but they drive right past me on the road. Then they loop back around the perimeter of the property. And I'm, well, this, this isn't ideal. Uh, it's getting close to when deer would probably be coming in. But, you know, they're probably just checking stuff, making sure the farm is, is locked up and all the gates are shut before they make their way out. Then they, they stop their truck right by the blind I had been in that morning. And uh, they hop out and I'm looking at through the glass and I see them gassing up a chainsaw. And then they hop the fence out into the, the desert and I can hear they, they start cutting up some wood out there. And this is right, I mean, one of the, of all the spots I could see, this was probably the top spot I thought deer would come from. And they walked right through it and started chopping wood with a chainsaw. Uh, and I get it. It's it's winter. They they brought it back. They cut it into logs. They threw, filled up the bed. It's like, they're, they're just trying to stay warm. I, I get it. But, man, it, it was not uh, boating well. And so, of course, I sat out there till dark. I glassed all the fields. And, I mean, I could, with the spotter, I could faintly see the total opposite side of the property. And I didn't happen to pick up anything. And so I got in my truck and drove home and felt dejected. Christmas came and went because that's what Christmas does. And uh, I, I found myself with the, the weekend right after Christmas, I, I knew I could get out the, the Saturday and the Sunday evening. Like, I, I wasn't going to go spend all day because the mornings, especially at the farm, are a real short crapshoot. So <laughs> I would drive an hour there and an hour back for maybe 45 minutes of viable hunting light if something's still on the property. But the evenings can kind of stretch out for a, a couple, three hours even, uh, depending on what the deer are doing that day. So I go out for the first evening. And again, the the tracks, the sign, everything is is drying up. And so I just pick a spot. Uh, totally other side of the property, but I could kind of hunker down by this this sort of berm and this big tree that's sort of in the, in between these two fields. And uh, nothing's going to come by me, but I could see these two fields where, you know, they're, it's still in, in what is called winter wheat. I'm not sure what that actually is, but it looks like a big grass and the deer like it that time of year. And I figure, okay, there I'm near the desert. So if something comes in, there's a possibility I could I could jump out into the desert, loop around, and, and actually make a spot and stalk play depending on where they are. And so I'm sitting there not terribly long, and about 4.30 I look up and here's this group of five or six does and fawns in the corner of a field uh, just, just feeding away. I think, okay, cool, sweet. I you know looked them over 19 different times through the spotter. There's not an antler in the bunch. But we are nearing when the rut should start happening, so maybe some bucks will come and join them and and just check on what's going on. And I'm sitting there. The, these I watch these deer feed for an hour almost. And no no other deer enter the property. Nothing's going on. Just sitting there looking at these does and fawns. And then I catch in the spotter. From the complete opposite side of that same field. Uh, I catch some movement. I throw up the spotter and look. And here comes this uh, little spike. Awesome. Okay. I would chase him. It's the end of the year. Uh, then right behind him is this decent sized forky. Okay. Even better. And right behind him is this big wide, uh, looks like a three by three, but he's wide and hefty. And I think this is awesome. Okay. Uh, and they're walking into the field kind of back in, in the corner 
And it looks like they're going to just come in and kind of feed and maybe feed their way to those does and fawns. And what I know about this field is almost almost every time I've seen deer in there, they hug the edge. Like there's there's a barbed wire fence and an open desert, and they usually kind of hug that edge because they if something gets funky, they can just bound over that fence and disappear into the brush. And so I figured this is perfect. I got a half hour of light left. I'm going to bomb out into the desert, make this huge loop, and come up on the other side. And if they're still just out there feeding, they should theoretically be within range while I'm on the other side of that fence tucked into the brush. And that's what I do. And I, I, I run through, and there's you know a couple of spots where I just have to crawl and pick my way through some really thick, nasty kind of wash brush. All the fun stuff that we get to move through here in the desert. But I'm finally approaching uh, the, the side that they're on, and I just have to dip down through this, this last little gully and, and creep on up to the edge. And as I'm moving through, I, I've, I've, like I ran for the first big chunk of it, and then as I get close, of course, I slow down and try to be real quiet. There is, I don't know, if I had to estimate, I would say 10,093 quail in this brush that I'm moving through. And as I go through, they flush out and it sounds like a helicopter taking off there are just so many birds uh and i i don't know if that's exactly what spooked them it it didn't help that's for sure but i i creep up to the edge and i I'm, i start peering into the field and the sun is i'm now looking into the last little bit of the setting sun and i can see a couple of those does off to one side and and i scan from the does to the other side where the bucks were and there are no other deer like those bucks are gone. Um, not sure if it was me, not sure it's possible they just kind of came in and fed for a little bit and then moved off. Who knows what they did, but, uh, or a massive swarm of quail flushed out and they thought that's suspicious and they got out of there. Either way, uh, it was a bust, but it was, it was a close call. And so it, it got me thinking, knowing that the next evening was the last chance I was going to have to hunt for the year. I thought, okay, I'm, I'm going to mix it up. I keep trying the spot and stalk thing. I, I like to have more options than than just to sit in one spot, but decided, you know what? Maybe maybe these things are going to run the same play. And I am going to come back the next night and I'm going to post up right by that corner where they entered and and see what happens. And so that's what I did. Uh, I came back the next evening, uh, parked my truck a good safe ways away where they wouldn't see it and wouldn't cause alarm, hiked all the way in, and then I found this, there were a couple of game trails uh, back in the corner where they were coming through into this field. <clears throat> and I just found the, the the first big, like leafy, brushy plant that almost had this little V-notch kind of naturally cut into it that was downwind from all the game trails where, where I saw those bucks. And so I just posted up on this little tiny stool, uh, bow in hand, cameras set and ready, and just made myself wait which is really hard for me to do, but I was just committed. You know what? I'm, I've been in this slump for a while and I'm just going to try something different, make myself sit here till the glow leaves my pins and see what happens. And so I de decided because sitting that way for hours is uncomfortable enough. I didn't want to, I, I'm a big proponent of when you're sitting there hunting. If, I mean, if you're, if you're ambush hunting, like have an arrow knocked, be ready to go. <clears throat> but I didn't want to be holding my bow in my hand while my hand freezes up and and cramps and everything for hours and hours and hours and so i told myself okay it's about 3 30 while i'm sitting down i'm just gonna leave my bow on the ground by 4 30 which is when i saw those does come out i'll i'll pick up my bow i'll knock an arrow i'll get myself ready i was really just trying to be there and be still and and just let everything settle down so the deer could come out sure enough before four o'clock, I see that same group of does and fawns in what is now the opposite edge of the field, uh, same spot that they came in the last time. And I thought, okay, that's cool. It's, so far, the play is running the same. It's a little earlier, but we're, they're doing the same thing. And then I hear, you know, the, the, the sound that you can, can't even compare to anything else, but it's the sound of deer hooves hitting the ground after they've jumped over a barbed wire fence. Uh, if you've heard it, you know it. If you haven't, you can imagine it. And so... I hear that and I look up and here is the little spike from the day before. And I thought, oh, okay, great. Well, now my bow is laying on the ground next to me. Um, no arrow, no nothing. So I, I fire up the cameras and I'm moving real slow and like trying to wait till he moments where he looks away that I can position myself and 
I get my bow up, I get an arrow knocked, and I start ranging him, and he is at 86 yards, uh, which is a farther shot than I'm going to take. Uh, I don't shoot a slider sight, uh, my last pin is 70, and I wasn't going to pin stack on... I've, I've never practiced a shot that far, I'm not going to make the first one I take at a live animal. And so I'm watching him and hoping, hey, maybe there's a chance he's going to kind of curve and veer to his right and actually move in closer to me. And he does not. He just keeps making his way out towards the doe and fawns. But now I'm ready. Okay, like, okay, we've had our first buck and he's entering from this side. Like, the plan is working. Uh, and it doesn't take long. A few minutes after that fork is, you know, past 100 yards away from me and on his way out, I catch some movement. And here comes that big forky from the day before. And he is, I, I catch him moving just on his way until he's behind, like between him and I, is this other huge, big clump of brush, the same kind of stuff I'm sitting in. And instinctively, like I didn't plan any of this, but but some just instincts took over. And once he moved behind that, I stood up from my stool and drew back. And sure enough, he, he popped back out on the other side on his way into the field. And I realized now like, oh, I've made a terrible mistake because I... I hadn't ranged a whole bunch of stuff. Usually I sit down, I range everything around so I can have estimates of, okay, if they come in here, then they're roughly this far. I hadn't done any of that yet because, again, it was earlier than I thought deer were going to be showing up. So he pops out of the other side, starts making his way into the field, and I'm just guessing, like, okay, I, he's probably 70. And so I, I lay that 70 pin on him. Wait, He stops moving for a second to, to chew on some grass. And so I... I pull back and I release and send that arrow with the 70 pin and I see him as the arrow is flying he jumps the string and I watch that arrow sail clean a foot or more over his back and then he he tears off stops in the corner of the field to look back to see what just happened and then he bounds over the fence and heads out and so I'm I'm calming myself down I'm like okay that was I mean it sucks that I missed but cool already got a shot on a deer uh and yesterday the th- Three, one, two, three is how the deer entered the field. But I'm sure the commotion that just happened, that that big guy who was bringing up the rear wasn't going to follow suit. And uh, sure enough, he didn't. Like the, the desert stayed quiet. Uh, I played the whole situation back in my head. I had footage that I watched. And, and then I started ranging things to try to figure out what happened. And in the aftermath, it became clear that that deer was much closer to 60 yards away. And so I overjudged it by 10 yards and he jumped it. And, and I found that arrow later, and there was nothing but mud on it. Uh, perfectly clean miss. And while I was still sitting there debating all that, uh, I chose to just hang out. Like, okay, that, that was some commotion. That If that big buck was on his way in, he certainly isn't coming in right now. But it's still early. Like, all of this happened before 4.30. And I've got till almost 6 before there's just absolutely no light left to shoot. And so... I'm just, I, I'm committed. Like I told myself you are going to sit in this spot and not leave until it's too dark to shoot because you just never know. And so I do, I sit in the next hour or so, nothing much happens. Uh, and I keep talking through what, what just went wrong and thinking, okay, if he comes back, I'll, I'll do this differently. Here's, here's how I'm going to play this. And sure enough, that buck comes back. That same Forky that I missed about an hour later, pops back into the field from the corner where he left. And he, uh, he got, he was understandably a little bit spooked. Uh, like he was ultra on alert and suspicious as I would be if I had just returned to a place where I had been shot at. Um, he never comes inside of 90 yards for me, but seeing him back in the field, looking around, uh, just confirmed like, yes, I completely 100% clean missed this buck. Um, I can ethically stay out here and keep hunting. Um, and he just kind of came into the field. He hung out for maybe a minute or two and kept looking my direction. And I was trying to stay still, but he, he saw something he didn't like. And so he bailed back into the desert. And so I thought, okay, well, this is, this is it. I'm just going to ride out the night. Uh, as I'm sitting there, the, the pile of the six does and fawns that started the evening had grown into this group of like a dozen deer. And as I'm looking at them through the spotter, there's, there's a couple of spikes in the group. And so um, I'm sitting there again, debating with myself, like, okay, I could, if I move down, I could use some cover. Maybe I could close the distance and, you know, they're 450, 500 yards away. Uh, But I'm trying to talk myself into 
hey, they're there. Maybe nothing else is coming this over on this side. I should get over there. And I'd made myself stay. Like, just no, this is the commitment. I'm trying something different. I'm just going to sit here and, and wait it out. As I watched the footage back later, because I was just recording those deer, uh, there was actually a really good sized buck that came and joined them towards last light. I never actually saw him while I was sitting there. But um, still, I, I stayed put and I'm glad I did because as the night wound down, uh, I always go by the glow of my pins. I, I don't have a, a pin light. So just as I'm looking, the red ones always seem to go dim first. And once I can't see those, I decide, okay, it's time to go. And so I looked at my pins and just said like, okay, I've got, I've got five minutes left. Five minutes before these pins aren't really lighting up and it's time to go. I'm just going to sit. Moments later, I hear breathing right behind me. Like I'm tucked into this brush and right behind that brush, something is moving and breathing its way along. And I think, oh, this is it. Like it is right there. I'm frozen totally still. I have a good wind. It's either a buck or it's a mountain lion and I'm about to die. But either way, I'm going to sit right here. Are you a new hunter or even a guy with some miles under his boots who's still just trying to figure it out? I get it. I've been there. I'm an adult onset hunter who spent the last 15 years learning how to hunt. And so I wrote the book, How to Hunt, A Total Beginner's Guide to Hunting Big Game, as the resource I wish existed all those years ago when I first started. Whether you're planning to chase elk with your bow in the west, or you're hunting for whitetails back east, this book will take you from knowing absolutely nothing to your first harvest. It's packed with hunting stories, and plenty of those times where I royally screwed up, you'll leave with a sound strategy for hunting big game, and have plenty of laughs along the way. Grab a copy today at latetothegameoutdoors.com slash howtohuntbook. And so I, I, I hear the breathing and it kind of moves to my left, which is the direction the game trail sort of naturally winds around this brush. And sure enough, to my left, in about 25 yards, this, this big buck just pops his head around and looks over at me. And I stay the, behind me. I'm tucked into this brush, so my outline's all obscured. I went full, like, face paint. I was, I was not messing around. And I just stayed totally still, arrow knocked, ready to go. And I knew, because now I had arranged some stuff, that he was... He was less than 30, and the path he was probably going to follow, he was going to stay in that top pin range. And so he pops his head out and looks at me for a couple seconds, then, you know, puts his head back down to the ground and continues walking. And so I kind of straighten up and adjust, and he catches something and, and looks back my way, and I freeze. Another few seconds of a staring contest, he puts his head back down, and he, he's making his way out, and there's this tiny little, it would be generous to call it a bush. It's basically like what becomes a tumbleweed, but still anchored into the ground. And he, once his head got behind that, I decided that was my moment to draw. So his head goes behind this little spindly desert dead thing. I draw back. He catches that movement, so he pops his head up to look at me. And now his, his entire, you know, the, the bread basket, his, his vitals and most of his body is obscured behind this bush. And I know it's spindly and dead, and, you know, I'm sure my arrow could pass through it, but I... I I just didn't feel good about it. I couldn't pick a spot. I, I didn't want to just shoot blindly through this bush. And so I just sit there at full draw, just praying that he would not spook. And so he stares at me for what felt like minutes. It was probably a few seconds. Then he puts his head back down and takes a couple more steps towards the field. And as soon as his body cleared that bush, I just rested that top pin right behind his shoulder, squeezed back, sent the arrow. I heard that thwack that is oh, just such a beautiful sound and he just goes tearing straight out into that field and it's getting dark so the further away he gets the harder it is to see him but i'm watching him just sprint at break breakneck speed towards those does and then i could swear in the faintest light probably 200 yards away i see his back legs buckle and he just spills out in that field and of course all the emotions then hit like the, the adrenaline dump, the, the shakiness, the everything. If, if you're a bow hunter, you know that moment. And I, I am just elated and still not wanting to count my chickens before they hatch. Like, yeah, I saw him. I saw him biff it. I'm, I'm sure he's dead out there or, but who knows? Like it's getting dark. Did I really see that? Did I imagine that? Um, I'm just, I'm just beyond excited. So I call my wife immediately to let her know 
not only because I want to celebrate with her, but also like, hey, this just became a late night. Uh, sorry, I told the kids I'd be home for bedtime. I will not. And then I immediately called my father-in-law, who lives not super far from the farm, and told him what was up. And hey, if you're not if you're not doing anything, sure wouldn't mind some help uh, dragging this guy out and skinning him up. And so uh, he agree. He's gets his stuff together and starts to head out. And so I I go and I check for blood. And there, there is great blood, but it looks like it's coming out of one side. Um, like it, it, I wasn't sure at the time, like where I hit, what kind of pass through, like great blood, but it looks like it's squirting out of one side. And so I think, man, I, I really don't want to just march out there and spook him if, you know, if it was less than ideal. Uh, so I decided to walk all the way back, grab my truck, drive it back down. Cause, cause I shot him on a road <laughs> or I mean, not on a road, like, the little farm road that crisscrosses through uh, the fields. I shot him right there. He ran out into the field so I could drive down this road and then just drag him straight over, throw him in the bed. And I was going to take him over. There's this big old tree on the property where when we kill deer, we like to string him up there and it just makes everything easier. And so I get my truck back, uh, back to the, the scene of the crime, start blood trailing through the field. And the blood stays good and it's it's looking i mean it doesn't it doesn't peter out like just every the the field is separated you know every 20 or so yards there's another kind of like berm which i think has something to do with guiding where the tractor goes i don't really know i'm not a farmer but uh and and on all of those dirt berms like that it was the easiest way to follow him i could see blood in the grass but every berm i could just see which direction he's going and he left some blood on it and then as I close in and get within, you know, 50 yards, my headlamp picks up the glow of deer eyes and he's laying dead right over there. And I walk up on him and he is bigger than I realized. Like all I when he first popped around the bush and turned his head, I saw antlers. And so I thought, great, this is a buck. I will shoot this buck. But I, in the, the heat of the moment, did not spend a lot of time looking at just how big of a buck he was. And he was good and wide. He has this one, his, his rear on his left side is this giant sword that shoots into the air. Uh, the front forks on the other side are humongous. Like he's, he's lopsided and symmetrical all at the same time. And I love it. But we, we drag him out and my father-in-law joins me about the time I find him, uh, drag him out and he is heavy, but, uh, throw him in the truck, barely, because again, he's heavy. Uh, we drive him over and we, we gut him and we hang him and we, we start cutting him all up. And man, we were there for probably a couple hours getting getting pictures and, and taking care of the meat and getting it on ice. And uh, man, it was a satisfying, exhausting evening. And for me personally, I, I, if you followed the podcast, you've heard many, many tales, most of which end with and I didn't kill anything uh, because I'd just been in this slump. Like I, I got to this point where I had I had a couple years in a row of good success and then it all dried up and not for lack of effort. I, I would double down on spending more time in the field and hunting different critters and going with people who knew what they were doing more than I did and going solo and just trying everything and, it, and having plenty of close calls, seeing plenty of critters, but just not having all the stars align. And so to finally have that all happen, um, all because I credit it to just making myself try something different, uh, taking that first night and just hoping, okay, this is what they did tonight. Maybe they'll do the same thing tomorrow. And I'm going to try this, this ambush point instead of uh, playing my usual spot and stalk game. And it just so happened to work out. Uh, I also credit it with sticking around till the very last moment of light. Uh, I get hungry and cold and bored and tired like anybody else and plenty of evenings I've been out hunting and then just kind of made my way back to the truck and realized, well, there's probably, you know, half an hour of light left, but yeah, I'm tired. I'm just going to call it. Uh, and I always regret that. There's always the like, yeah, but what if, but what if I had stuck it out and then right at last light, something happened. Uh, so if there's anything to be learned, any encouragement, it would just be stick it out. Use every available second of light that you have, <laughs> legal, ethical light, of course, uh, to, to be hunting and just mix it up. If, if you're in a rut, which happens a lot and we don't really like to talk about it because it's, well, it's not fun. Um, man, maybe just try some, try a different species, try a different area. Try, if you're always trying 
you know, this one like tree stand hunting and that doesn't seem to be working. Well, I don't know, move your stand or spend a day still hunting. Just, just, just shake it up. It forces you to think differently, to, to hunt differently. And, and maybe you'll find some success just by trying something different. Guys, thank you for listening. I know that this podcast tends to be kind of hit or miss. Uh, I'll, I'll blast out a few episodes and then I will get consumed with life. And I'm sorry about that. I'm trying to be more consistent with all things media. If you want to see the the film of this hunt, it's actually a combination of the family hunt before this and this. Uh, I, I put one together that I'm, I'm pretty proud of. It's over on YouTube. I'll put a link below to that specific video while you're there if you want to subscribe. I am currently doubling down on YouTube content, so there is fresh stuff hitting every week over on that YouTube channel. Um, and sometimes I will add these podcast episodes over there. But thank you guys again for listening. We will be back soon. I've got big, big plans for 2021, and I cannot wait to tell some of these stories and uh, and get some other stories, some some fresh guests and some new perspectives on here. So thanks again. We will see you guys next time. Thanks so much for tuning in to Hunting Stories. And if you want to stay up on what we're doing with the podcast or anything else going on with Late to the Game, go ahead and check us out at latetothegameoutdoors.com or give us a follow on Instagram at latetothegameoutdoors. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you guys next time.